So thanks to the power of collaborative NIPS community, uh, we're pleased to introduce Anshu Mallory uh, Shibristava, who's going to be talking about asymmetric LSH for sublinear time maximum inner product search, or MIPS at MIPS. <laughs> and this is uh, one of the outstanding uh, paper award uh, prizes. So um, a round of applause and congratulations to Anshu Mali and Ping for their prize, sponsored by Springer's Machine Learning Journal. Thanks, thanks, Nips, for the, the great encouragement. So this is joint work with my great advisor, Ping. And I'll tell you how to solve maximum inner product search. So this is the formal setting of the problem I am interested in. So we are given a giant collection of vectors in some r to the power d. And I'm given a query, and I'm interested in searching this collection for an element x, which maximizes the inner product. So this is not an NP-hard problem. It's worst case linear. But we will look into scenarios where querying is frequent and n is huge. And so this maximum inner product search or MIPS problem will become bottleneck step in many applications. And therefore, our goal is to solve this efficiently and we are looking for something sublinear. And one thing to note that this is not same as the classical near neighbor search problem if the norms of the element in the collection is varying. And we'll see scenarios where if it's not a good idea to use methods which are meant for near neighbor search. So here is first scenario, which is typical user item recommendation. So we are given a rating matrix. We know few of the entries. We don't know most of them. And the task is, well, given a user, I want to recommend the best item to him. And typically, the way this is solved is we use a matrix factorization approach to find the latent user and item feature. And we model the rating as an inner product. And so given a user, the best item to recommend is a classical MIPS instance. Again, the vectors U and V are learned, and so we have no control over their norms. Here is another common scenario, which is multi-class prediction. So we use one versus all SVMs, and so we learn one weight vector for every class. And given a test data, if you want to predict its level, it's a standard MIPS instance because we compute the inner product of all the weight vectors with the data and report the class which has the maximum inner product. Again, the weights are learned, and so we don't have control over their norms. It is very easy to find data sets these days, which has probably 100,000 classes, and we think in practice it's much more. And testing time is very critical in applications which has problems with latency. So this is, it's, it will be good if we can speed that up. One reason why we were interested in actually finding efficient solution was MIPS was because we wanted to train big architectures. And we are already have started working on it. So we now understand that we need giant networks to, for large data sets. And to deal with such a huge parameter space, there has been a wonderful line of work which, uh, which deals with what is called the problem of vanishing gradients. And the idea is, that instead of updating all weights for all the hidden nodes, we selectively update the weights for nodes having high activation. And high activation naturally translates into maximum inner product search. And so if we have, can efficiently solve MIPS, we have a fast training and testing algorithm for very big deep architectures, which we think is a significant contribution. And so, and again, no, we have no control over the norms. So this is, not same as the near neighbor search problem. And in fact, there are many more applications. For example, if you were in the Professor Nestro's talk, he was talking about max of a fine function approximation, which is a maximum inner product search instance. Then there are other applications. For example, in cutting plane, we want to find the most violated constraint. And all of them can be written as a maximum inner product search. Well, so hopefully, I have convinced you that this is a very important problem. And so we'll see how to solve it. And uh, this is what I have in mind. I'll go through the, a short introduction on what locality sensitive hashing is and how we can do sublinear near neighbor search with it. Then there is some trouble with NIPS as in like we cannot use the conventional hashing to do it, but we'll anyway do it with an unconventional method. Then I'll show you some experiments and we'll look into some extensions. Okay, so what is locality sensitive hashing? So it is hashing. So you give me a vector and I give you a key. That's a standard notion of hashing. And the key space is discrete. 
it has one additional property, which is called locality sensitive, which says that if you give me two data points x and y, then the probability that their hash value agrees or collide has, is monotonic in the similarity. So this definition is a quite a strong definition, but it is uh, sufficient for the purpose of the talk. So what it says is that if you look at this point here, which I have red, green, and black ones, so the, the closer points, which are the red and the green one, are likely to have the same hash value as compared to the, the black one. And uh, one thing to note here is that I can compute h with, uh, on x without knowing y. So if today you give me x, I give you a hash key. If 10 days later you give me y, I give you another hash key, and I still guarantee that the probability that the two hash keys are equal is monotonic in the similarity. So similar points are likely to agree. Now, well, it's interesting, and there is a lot of work on existence of such hash functions. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, it's sufficient to assume that there exists a hash function for L2 distance, and so there, uh, this, the hash functions are typically based on random projection and the quantization, and uh, it can be shown that the collision probability under these such hash functions is monotonic in the L2 distance, and there are more works on it. So, okay, we have a locality sensitive hashing. So how do we do sublinear near neighbor search? So here is an idea. For example, suppose I have two hash functions, h1 and h2, which are locality sensitive. And for the time being, let's assume that they only take four values, zero, one, two, and three. So I can encode them in binary. So the, I, I will use h1 to, to determine the first half of the address and h2 to determine the second half of the address. So in the figure, suppose I have an orange point and h1 is 0, 0, and h2 is 0, 1. Then I create a hash table and store this orange point at a location 0, 0, 0, 1. And then similarly, I will process all the data points. So I have created a hash table, and I'm done pre-processing. Now suppose a query arrives, then I will use the same hash functions, to, uh, h1 and h2, to compute the hashes of the query. Suppose the hashes comes out to be 1, 1, and 0, 1. Then I will only probe bucket 1, 1, 0, 1. So I'm not scanning all the data, I'm just probing a bucket. And the argument is that it's a good bucket. Why it's a good bucket? Because all the points sitting in that bucket has h1 equal to 1, 1, and h2 is equal to 0, 1, because that's how they were pre-processed. And we know that collision is an indicator of high similarity, so this bucket has, is likely to contain more similar points than the query. We are already doing much better than random. And the theory says that this better than random idea can essentially be boosted. So in the previous example, I was using two hash function, h1 and h2. In, I, I can choose k of them, where k is something which I can tune. And instead of just creating one hash table, I can create l independent hash tables. And while querying, I will report the union of l buckets, one from each table. And theory says that if we are smart in choosing about k and l, then there is a sweet spot, and we can find probably sublinear algorithm. So that's the classical LSH algorithm, and all it needs is a hash function which where, where if two points are similar, they are likely to agree. Now that is what is a trouble with inner products. So for inner products, it is not difficult to find x and y such that x transpose y is much greater than x transpose x. Yes, it's a little weird that self-similarity is not highest, but well, it's an important problem and we want to solve it. And suppose there exists a locality sensitive hashing, say h, then under this hash function, I would like the h of x to agree with h of y with more probability as h of x with h of x. But that actually cannot happen because of h of x is equal to h of x is an identity. So this is essentially the complete proof of why we cannot have a locality sensitive hashing for inner products. Well, the good thing about negative results is that it somehow tells us what not to do. So it's, it, it seems that the main culprit here is the symmetry. So by symmetry, I mean we are using the same hash function to create buckets and the same hash function to probe buckets. But if you look at the proof of locality sensitive hashing, there is no such requirement. In fact, if I use a mechanism, say P, for creating buckets, and a different mechanism, say Q, for probing buckets, and so long as I guarantee that the bucket I am landing is a good bucket, which means that the probability of Q of Q is equal to the probability of P of X, if this is monotonic in Q transpose X, everything works as it is. Same proof works, 
So it, it seems that symmetry was just unnecessary part of the locality sensitive hashing definitions. All right, so that's great. We want to find P and Q that makes this thing in red that probability of Q of Q equal to P of X monotonic in Q transpose X. How do we go about it? Well, all this thing is very philosophical. How do I find P and Q? It seems when we are lost, what, what essentially works is try, try to reduce the problem to the domain with we are comfortable in. And it actually has a name in mathematics. It's called the tea kettle principle. And it's based on a joke that if a mathematician knows how to make tea from scratch, and if you give him a kettle of boiling water and ask him now make the tea, he will just throw away the boiling water and he has solved the problem because he has reduced the instance with boiling water to an instance without a boiling water. So it, it, it may sound like a bad idea, but it's very useful in scenarios when we don't know how to proceed. So we want probability of Q of Q equal to P of X to be monotonic in Q transpose X. This is what we want. So let's start with something known, what we know. So we know how to construct H such that probability of H of Q is equal to H of X is monotonic in the L2 distance. That's the standard L2 hash. And I have just expanded the formula for L2 norm which is the norm of Q square plus norm of X square minus two Q transpose X. Now I like the term Q transpose X because that I want, but I don't like the term norm of X square and norm of Q square. And from the previous philosophical slide, I know that I can stick in P and Q where P and Q could be anything. So after sticking in P and Q, the formula looks something like this. That is Q of Q norm whole square plus P of X norm whole square minus Q the two, two times the inner product between the transformed, asymmetrically transformed Q and X. Now I know how to have a hash function which is monotonic in this, in this expression. So can I choose key and P and Q which makes this expression monotonic in Q transpose X? And if I can do that, I'm essentially done. And this is, it, you, we can show that it's sufficient. And one, another idea that we can use is we can expand the dimension as a part of P and Q. Why? Because locality sensitive hashing guarantees are independent of the dimensions. And so here is one transformation that works. So what you do is you first take your whole data in the collection and you scale it down so that every norm is less than one. Remember, it is not normalizing. You cannot normalizing change the ordering of inner product, scaling doesn't. Now once you have done that, what you do is you simply append few more scalars to your vector. So for P of Xi, you just append few terms like Xi, norm of Xi square, norm of Xi to the power four up to norm of Xi to the power two to the power M, some M scalars to your vector. Now that's your P transformation. And for the query, you simply append M halves. Now it's a two line exercise to show that the L2 norm of Q of Q and P of Xi is the expression shown on the right hand side. In that expression, I like Q transpose X because that's what I want. M by four doesn't hurt me. The norm of query also doesn't hurt me for the ordering, but we can get rid of it. So that's not a problem. And uh, the only problematic term could be the norm of Xi to the power two to the power M plus one. But well, I have shrink the norm to be less than one. So this term actually goes to zero at a tower rate, which is exponential raised to exponential. And so what is happening is the ordering under the L, uh, L2 distance of the asymmetrically transformed Q and P is same as the ordering of inner product. And that is essentially the whole idea. And if you're wondering how I get to this transformation, I have used another fundamental principle, which is called the method of trial and error. So, well, the arguments can be made rigorous. It, uh, we need few extra knobs and then optimize those knobs to get a better guarantee. The only assumption we need to solve maximum inner product search is that your data lies in a bounded radius, which is always satisfied in practice. There is some subtlety as to why these additional knobs that we added does not bother us. Well, it's inherent in locality sensitive hashing itself because the way locality sensitive hashing works is you give us a C approximate instant and then I based on choose, choose my own state and give you a data structure which guarantees you sublinear algorithm. And usually there is no fixed choice which works for all thresholds. And exactly same is true for the new, frame, new hashing scheme. Well, we borrow everything, so that's, that's kind of true. And the takeaway message is that we do not lose any properties. And well, what about in practice? Well, in practice, there is a good choice. So in the plot here, the bold lines are the optimal running time guarantee, 
with different approximation ratio and different thresholds. And the dotted lines are the running time guarantee with this fixed choice of the uh, parameters that I have introduced. And so this is the parameters that we are going to use everywhere in all the uh, experiments, irrespective of the data set and threshold. And this is what we recommend. So here is how the final algorithm looks like. You scale the data to make it norm less than 0 0.83. You append three norms, that is just three numbers, and you use standard L2LSH. While querying, you just append three halves and use standard L2LSH, and that is it. It's a surprisingly simple algorithm. It's probably two, three line of code change to implement, and so now it's interesting to see if I'm modifying L2LSH by this small amount, how much benefits do I get in practice? So here is the data set and setting. We use the standard collaborative filtering data set, which is MovieLens, the largest one, 10 million, the Netflix. And we use standard matrix factorization techniques with standard recommendation of uh, the latent dimension to generate user and item features. Now given a user query, our task is to find the best item, which is a MIPS instance, and we want to evaluate how much savings we obtain in practice. For, for comparison, we are using the proposed hash function the L2 LSH, which, is, uh, which we slightly modify and make it our new hash function, and a other, another popular hash function in practice, which is the signed random projections. So here is the ranking experiments, which is evaluating how well the ranking under hash collision is correlating with the actual ranking. So I'm plotting precision and recall of top 10 gold standard in our products, and the ranking is computed based on the number of hash collisions, where the, we take six, from 16 hashes, 64 hashes, or 256 hashes. The top one is movie lens, the bottom one is Netflix. Higher precision at a given recall is better. So the black ones, uh, th there are a lot of them, they are all L2 LSH with different setting of parameters. We were never sure that we got this big improvement just by slight modification, so we plotted all of them, all possible parameters of L2 LSH. And we see that despite those choice, the red curve is way higher than both the L2LSH and signed random projection. So this big improvement, just by slightly changing the algorithm, we think that we have really hit the right, right thing, as in to expand the dimension, add few things that has to do with the norms. Okay, so that was ranking evaluation. It's not the actual bucketing experiment. So the next thing we did is, we want to see how much, uh, we obtain, how much computational savings we obtain in practice. So we did the actual bucketing experiments. And so the plots here on the y-axis, you are seeing the fraction of multiplication compared to a linear scan that you do to achieve the recall which is plotted on x-axis. So the lower is better, and here to, we have to ensure that we, we choose the op parameters KNL optimally. So at every recall level in this plot, we are finding the best KNL and then reporting that value. So this, this one plot here is a summary of actually 16,000 experiments where we vary KNL over like all good choices. And we can clearly see that uh, the proposed scheme gives much improvement over the other ones. So the way to read these plots is to achieve 80% recall, the red scheme, which is the proposed one, does 20% of the work, whereas the other scheme does probably 40, 60, most, lot of the work. All right, so what, what have I done? Let's, let's look at back. And we started with we, take, we took the L2 LSH and used asymmetric transformation to convert it into a hashing scheme for inner products. Well, what is special about L2 LSH? Nothing. In fact, if you are working with hash functions for a long time, you know that there are two other hash functions out there, which is signed random projection and minwise hashing, and they have much better properties. This is what we showed in this year's ICML. And so, well, it's a good curiosity to start with cosine similarity and convert it into a hash function for inner products. We can do that. And more interesting one is the minwise hashing. So if your data is very sparse, then you can actually use the Jacquard similarity and come up with different asymmetric transformation, which are again not very difficult, and you get a much better improvement in uh, retrieving inner products. And again, the whole exercise is you play around with the dimension, add terms, and cancel out the effect of the terms that you don't want. So I'll conclude, we, we provide a very simple, practical, Hashing algorithm for maximum inner product search. Ma MIPS is a subroutine in many machine learning application. We hope that the benefits are going to be huge. And well, the construction is play around with norms and play around with dimensions and create many more hash functions that we want. And the idea is fairly general. And in the end, I would like to thank funding agency, all the reviewers, and Professor Thorsten Yockums and machine learning class of Cornell 2014. Thank you very much.
Okay, we have time for uh, one or two questions. Please use the mics to come on up. And could the folks um, who are going to be spotlight presenters please come and line up here in numerical order? Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, uh, I had uh, one question about uh, comparisons, actually. Uh, so nice thing about this, uh, your work is that uh, you are dealing with vectors which are not of the same magnitude. If they are the same magnitude, then it's a standard sim hash, the sign random projection. That will work fine to capture the cosine, equivalence of the cosine similarity. Magnitude of yeah. the norm. Right. Oh, yeah. right? So uh, traditionally in the community, uh, the way uh, to solve these kind of problems is to separate the angles between vectors from the magnitude uh, or, or, or the norm, what you're saying, and uh, use shape gain quantization kind of things ah. where you hash angle and norm separately. Okay. And uh, so I was wondering, like, uh, have you looked at that literature and how it compares with your work? So the answer is the, the Main answer is no, I haven't looked at those, but I am not entirely sure. So you, you are saying that there are, so we can deal with angles differently. We know how to deal with angles using sign random projection. And we can deal with norms also, and we can combine them. Right, so you, you do the quantization in the norm space and standard hashing in the angle space, and okay. just directly combine them. Very also some sort of a hybrid doing. approach. Exactly. And it has, it is, it has the same like sort right. of. Right. Um, no, I haven't tried. No, but uh, but that's an like, interesting thing. I mean, I'll ask you for the link, and then maybe we can try. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks.